<laughs> Even though like we're in a WordPress agency, I, I would probably mm. first like think about, hmm, is WordPress the right choice for that? Or should you consider something else? Today we're talking about headless and static WordPress. Yay, Stefan, what is headless WordPress? <laughs> Don't ask me about that. <laughs> I'm probably not the best to person to talk about this. Actually, gotta be honest, I know not a lot about these things. Like I know about the theory, I just have little to no practical experience. So I am very curious to learn a lot, hopefully today from you, uh, and to discover about this topic. I remember that for quite some time, it has been a couple of years ago, that many people, especially uh, non-tech people, approached me about, hey, do you do headless now? I heard headless is the best and everyone has to do headless and the future is headless. Yeah, it is. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Now you go. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, so, okay, I, I want to like extend the whole topic a little bit, right? Because before we can talk about headless WordPress, I want to talk about static WordPress. Mm -hmm. um, because like, why, like, what is the initial drive or the initial motivation to have something else than regular WordPress, right? And um, usually, uh, it's something like, yeah, uh, WordPress is so slow, um, we want uh, it to um, I know to serve files immediately. WordPress is so insecure. We don't want to expose like uh, the the backend to uh, the website or any PHP and so on. PHP is insecure. Like and there are so many like motivations. Some of them are valid. Some of them are not so valid. Um, but uh, I remember the first time that we encountered static WordPress um, was when we had a really big project uh, where there was a TV commercial on like, and I think it was like New Year's Eve on all major German television uh, um, stations, uh, this commercial was broadcasted at the same time. So um, the client expected uh, like a massive um, traffic on the website uh, for Germany, yeah. right? And in that case, they were like, yeah, but WordPress, do you, like, we don't want to have a PHP server uh, running that can potentially break, but we want to load everything on a CDN as static files. And uh, then um, we won't have an issue because the CDN uh, will not go down, uh, most likely, right? It was even a, like a big like enterprise C uh, CDN, um, Akamai, uh, in that case. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, that's like, how long ago was this? Like 10, 13 mm -hmm. years ago? <laughs> Not quite. I'd say probably it was, ah, yeah, maybe 2013, no. 2014, 2015. No, it, it must have been 2014. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, oh no, 2013 in uh, December, because it was before the uh, World Cup the in The World Brazil, Cup. Right? So... Okay, yeah. so almost 10 years. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So it's so not it an entirely new topic, yeah. at least like static site generation on uh, and post, uh, putting that on CDNs and so on. Um, we, we've done that <laughs> for quite some while. It, and I know, I know that kind of stuff. And mm. to jump into the topic rather quickly, it's, it's not that I like, I don't, I don't think about these things and, and I never like, uh, considered um, these, but like with uh, headless systems, I always looked at the complexity that it adds and try to understand what kind of advantages these this would bring in terms of speed and flexibility and coding. I just never saw that there was a need for that just because mm -hmm. we were able to achieve statically yeah. generated sites without a headless approach. And that's kind of when people approach me and say, uh, you need headless because then you have static. Then it's like, hmm, no, that's actually not true. Listen to our caching episode about full site caching. And that is static page generation as well with the dynamic backend at the same time. But in this very specific case, we did it differently, right? We did not mm -hmm. just install a caching plugin, but but we generated static assets 
whenever something changed in the back end or when you did like a manual uh, um, deployment process and uh, we basically uh, generated all the html and and asset files uh, and uploaded them to the cdn right so it, it yeah. wasn't even like a a pull CDN, it was like a push CDN where we actually said, okay, here are some new assets, please uh, deliver them now to all the visitors. Right. And um, the reason for that is because like with static caching plugins, you still need to go through the server, right? For some plugins, you even have to go through PHP, like load the entire WordPress, um, like skeleton, so to say, and then the site is served. Um, if you have the correct server set up, these files will be served directly from the web server, like Apache or Nginx. Um, or you have like another static uh, caching layer, like Varnish, for example, uh, in front where you then, but still you have to hit the server with like a request, right? And usually like if, uh, I don't know, if you have a million concurrent requests, like a server might go down. <laughs> A CDN will not. Might. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Most likely um, will, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's why, um, and I totally agree with what you said. Um, like, headless was, like, is a trend, was a trend, and was, like, really hyped for a while. But a lot of the times, people don't want headless, but people want static. Yeah? And mm -hmm. that's why I, I wanted to, like... Um, elaborate on that a little bit so and um there are tools for this for word like specifically for wordpress right so there are um there's like simply static uh which is like a free and premium plugin um there are some other plugins as well and they work m more or less good and they are integrated into like your wordpress environment right but in general to be um to be uh, fair you don't even need a WordPress specific tool to make a site static. Like uh, maybe some of you know, like web spiders from back in the day where you said, okay, I want to download this website uh, and have a local mm -hmm. copy of that. And that's basically what you need to do. You need to crawl through your website and get all of the files that are associated, that are linked, that are on the same domain uh, and put them like rewrite the URLs like make them, for example, um, relative URLs instead of absolute URLs. Um, and then um, you uh, basically pack them together and you have a static copy of uh, of your file. And there are tools, mostly like uh, Python is really big in this uh, um, uh, scraping business, but lately also JavaScript, uh, like there are some node packages, CLI tools that you can use to like scrape an entire website and then um, you have a local copy, a static copy that you can put anywhere, upload anywhere you want, and then have it served via CDN. And um, actually, it's not necessarily, or if you do good SEO, right, um, you don't actually need to say crawl everything. Like here is the root URL, please crawl everything, follow every link and whatever. But you can limit yourself to like the um, uh, the sitemaps, right? Mm. So you read the sitemap, you get a list of all the links, you download these files and you check for all the images or the style sheets or the script files and so on, and then bundle that together in yeah. like a local folder. That sounds great. I yeah. just realized we started from from the back kind of this time. We start with opinion and with how you can <laughs> do it alternatively without doing like going the the usual route. Um, that's very interesting. Do you know a specific tool? You said like some Python tools probably. Is there any specific tool that comes to your mind how to do this uh, spider crawling approach? I think it's like Node Web Scraper or Node Scraper. It's like for Node. Okay. The Python tools, I don't really know that well because I, I personally, I always like to um, like tweak things, right? And since I, um, I'm better in writing JavaScript and it feels more comfortable and uh, mm. yeah, I uh, usually use Node or JavaScript-based tools. Okay. Yeah. Okay, probably there are a lot, lot of tools to do this kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. but let's probably get back or start with the, with what actually 
a headless website is or what, what are the concepts typically of headless development? We talked about static already, what static is and how you can generate static sites. What's the concept of headless websites and what are the advantages uh, specifically mm. of that? Yeah, so again, in general, a website cannot be headless, I guess, because a website is like the head. That's uh, um, like my interpretation, at least, right, uh, if, if I hear that. So a headless server or headless CMS is basically, um, like, for me, the simple definition is a um, CMS or a service that doesn't provide HTML output, but it only provides like an API that other services can consume. That means you turn WordPress and WordPress has a, um, a REST API. There's even like in the headless space, a lot of people actually prefer to use uh, GraphQL. So there is like a, a GraphQL uh, um, plugin um, that is actually sponsored now by uh, WP Engine again. They sponsor like a lot that we, <laughs> we talk about, it feels like, and they do a lot uh, for the WordPress developers. So um, yeah, it was uh, started by Jason Ball as uh, a side project and then um, he got employed by uh, WP Engine to work on this. Um, yeah, and then you have like an API and then like this is just headless headless WordPress. Like you don't use any uh, templates, you don't use any of the rendering, um, but you only use this as like a data store and model your data. And then um, you can render um, this um, with some other technology. And there you are actually free to to do whatever mm. you want. But a lot of the times it is actually uh, then a JavaScript front end or some JavaScript tool because um, of the loud majority of like front end developers that prefer to use JavaScript uh, for these kind of things, right? The, the loud minority. The Sorry. loud minority. minority. No, You're referring to this <laughs> blog post. Yeah. Uh, who who wrote that? Andy Bell. Andy Bell. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I, I I very much enjoyed reading that. I kind of agree with that. Um, so yeah, more in detail for myself to mm -hmm. understand, or I, I try. I think I need to validate if my understanding. Is, is correct. So you, you have WordPress to model your data. First of all, how do you model then data in WordPress? Because WordPress doesn't have data models, right? Because usually yes. it just like creates HTML. So yeah. what do I get? Routes. Well, that's actually a big, like not a big problem, but this, this is a, one of the um, challenges also in, in Headless. Uh, how much uh, styling and, and ready made HTML, uh, do you actually save in the database, right? Because in, mm -hmm. in, uh, WordPress, if you just use, uh, Gutenberg or if you use, um, the, uh, the post content like tiny MCE, uh, before you have like all the formatting basically in line, uh, and, and done like that. So then you don't have any control when, when you render something then in the front end, you don't have any control over styling this, right? Because the control is in the back end. So this is actually a little bit mm, problematic or it goes against the, the actual um, headless uh, style. Headless is perfect yeah. for like structured data where you can say, okay, yeah. I have a headline, uh, I have a, a paragraph, which is only text and I don't like, maybe you, you add like uh, EM or like strong or uh, uh, things like that, but uh, no other, um, no other formatting uh, of yeah. any kind. And um, they are actually um, one of the most, uh, uh, or the, the earliest um, uh, big headless CMS uh, as a service was like Contentful. And I think like in Contentful, if you have formatted, formatted data or like a, a blob of HTML, it's never like a blob of HTML, but you have like a JSON file with like um, really split down. So it says like um, paragraph and in there is like an LI. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and then so it's like really um, stripped down so that you um, can actually uh, build, like have it like really headless, like render anything you want out of this, right? 
Like so in an ideal headless setup, you you have kind of like API endpoints uh, where you get the data for a certain URL um, and then generate a static page out of that with your static site generator, which is a separate tool development environment where you pass the data that you get from the API and then do the actual rendering and styling within that static page. Uh, generator right in, in your template in your dev environment but for that yeah ideally you will you will need very well structured data that's how uh, these other platforms probably like contentful got popular with flint with our approach we can also do the same thing like we can then render instead of a template we can render kind of json and or like structured data or uh, probably even with the graphql uh, and give you all the different components that are on a page with the different fields and so on and very limited HTML and decide not to put in any styles because with our approach, the data is very much structured and we can give that to people more like to a separate environment. We did something similar like that. For example, we then generated um, the data for a chatbot, for example, so it can work also with the live website data and stuff like that. But yeah, I'm still wondering how do all the WordPress people do that? Like, uh, how, how where do you draw the line in terms of rendering and inline styles and CSS? Wouldn't this, wouldn't there be, or aren't there like a, a lot of challenges with that? There are like really a, a lot of challenges, and that's why it has become so popular popular in in the WordPress uh, 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 realm. And uh, I mean, it, it's getting a bit more popular now again. But uh, yeah, I, I want to get back to later. Uh, um, the okay. statics, the static aspect or static site generator, what you just mentioned. But I just want to also like emphasize that, yeah, with Flint's approach and also when we talked about data modeling, the different approaches that there are to, um, to, uh, modeling, like, or giving your data more structure is, uh, basically essential. Uh, otherwise, when you only work with, um, and I mean, with Gutenberg, you can sort of, also extract more structured data from that it's just not by default enabled right but you could um, get all the blocks separated uh, get like all the attributes separated in like an array and don't have like only the html but then again like it's um it, it's not really meant for that uh, currently i would say mm. yeah and and also in the wordpress ecosystem what one thing that you shouldn't forget like all the plugins that you use all the plugins that add to the ui and that render something in the front end cannot be used without additional work in a headless environment right so um yeah for example in 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 wordpress you or in a regular wordpress install you have uh, all these hooks and for example you have like wp head uh, and um, when you install a Zeo plugin, it will just render some meta tags in the head, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and you don't have to do anything else. But um, if you have a headless environment, there is no WP head. <laughs> you need to query the structured data, say, okay, get the metadata, and then write your own code of how to render this, right? And this yeah. is where the so it the gets big... a lot more complicated. You yes. need to rebuild certain parts of standard WordPress functionality, kind of. Yes. Right. Yeah. At this and point, I almost feel like this cannot be it, right? Because <laughs> why would it then be so popular if it made things a lot more complicated? And yes. still, I haven't understood many advantages beyond aesthetically generate a page that you can also create otherwise. So please, and I mean that, yes. people listening to this, tell me where where I'm profoundly wrong about this, what, I, what I'm what i not understanding, why people think this is so great. Maybe there are great frameworks uh, and, and great approaches that I really just don't understand. But mm. so far, I don't. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're getting there. Um, so, uh, as I said, like uh, you, you, you were talking about, uh, you then take like a static site generator, implement like your rendering logic, and then you generate it. And yes, you could do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, we have seen for these statically generated sites, it's actually not that like th th there's n no good reason 
for using that because you can just generate a static site in uh, in uh, WordPress um, or with WordPress or with external tools. But a headless approach for WordPress doesn't like you're not limited to static site generators you can use like any sort of framework in front that renders things right the most popular one is like uh, next.js in node uh, it's like a web framework that gives you a, a nice uh, developer experience um has like uh, really good integrations like it has a, a big like javascript um, overhead let's put it that way that is also downloaded um to the um uh, by the uh, visitor. Um, so that's why I would say for like regular WordPress websites, this is not really the best uh, um, tool. But then there's, um, for example, Astro um, or Astro, um, which is also like a um, full, like, or a framework uh, for um, Node.js that actually um, renders pages without serving any JavaScript, only if you want to make. Um, areas or islands interactive on the page so this is like really close to also what we are doing in flint then you would uh, load some additional javascript and there also you get a nice developer experience and this is what a lot of these javascript frameworks focus on right they say like dx is the most important thing and um so you can use n nicer development frameworks that have a better developer experience and if you know these frameworks for example or certain stacks you might be actually very comfortable with this approach if you're not coming yes. from wordpress it might be very nice to just build a website with a wordpress backend but with your kind of natural stack like if you come from the other side if you come from from uh a javascript front end background the other side yeah <laughs> you come from the other side is that is that the we, bright we, side or the dark side i don't know <laughs> it's <laughs> open for debate <laughs> but let's say you're not a php developer the right mm. you, you're not a php developer you're a javascript developer and you mm. know about these fancy new things and you have installed like um astro to uh, uh, get like a content website running then the question is okay um i need to store my data somewhere and i need the users to edit that and then you could mm -hmm. either use like a paid service or like some of the free javascript tools that are out there that are quite difficult sometimes to set up uh, the free ones are like a director strappy uh, and so on then there's also a lot of paid ones um, but there's also like uh, wordpress <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you can use WordPress with like, for example, ACF or with uh, Flint to like prepare your structured data in a way so that you can easily consume it with your, um, with your JavaScript uh, um, framework. Mm -hmm. But okay, so if you come from this side, right, or from, from this angle, uh, then uh, it, it might make sense to use WordPress in such a way. Now, is there maybe also a reason why someone with a PHP background who is um, like would use WordPress headlessly, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, um, there's a definite yes. I would do that if I had a lot of different APIs to integrate. Mm -hmm. Or for example, if I have a web shop on Shopify and I have a WordPress website um, or like maybe some other APIs, some ERP, like uh, data warehouse stuff, where I do have some issues integrating that into PHP or where, um, yeah, things might be complicated or maybe there's another team involved, like with multiple teams, then I would say, okay, it makes sense to just strip the rendering out of uh, WordPress and then use headless WordPress uh, for that. Because the reason to use WordPress is that in general, or at least like in, in the past, WordPress was like the easiest tool for clients to work with and also the tool mm -hmm. that they are most familiar with um, because it is a familiar UI. Like in, in most companies or like most projects or um, even if you, are, uh, if you just want to start a blog, probably the first thing that you would go to is WordPress. So you are um, familiar in a way with that. In order to offer that for the client for normal content editing, 
you could offer this experience and then just have a more integrated um like a rendering um with like one of these uh, javascript front end uh, okay. meta frameworks so like the challenges or requirements of the project would be would be more towards uh the front end development and in integration of other services and the part that wordpress is kind of best at kind of content uh, creation would be more like a side need kind of or or not 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 like you expect not to put the primary effort into that but a building more like a large piece of software platform where the developer again kind of experience and ease of use of external apis and integration uh is more important yeah yeah this is one thing another thing is um for example if you don't only have a wordpress website so if you want the same content to be on uh, a mobile app, this usually, or maybe on a TV app, or like in, in different where, where you cannot use WordPress to render the content, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, like a, a native mobile app, for example, then yeah. you would definitely, you would need to provide an API. And if you're providing that API anyways, the question is, do we like encapsulate it completely? And say this is separate from everything and we do like the rendering of all of the clients of all of the products uh, separately then it mm -hmm. would also make sense it's I, I, also absolutely yeah. and i think i've seen similar cases um that we had uh, before um i'm just like i i think um, there, there are also like many cases coming to my head where I would say, but if that's kind of the requirement to have very central structured data and so on, honestly, WordPress probably wouldn't be my first choice. <laughs> Even though like we're in a WordPress agency, I, I would probably yeah. first like think about, hmm, is WordPress the right choice for that? Or should you consider something else as being your central data warehouse? Um, yes. There are. Like they are sure, very good use cases I, for, for exactly that approach. I just feel so far still, <laughs> they are very specific, very limited um, for very specific cases. Yeah. Yes, that's true. One, um, like uh, another uh, um, example, if you have a really um, high traffic internationally, um, business, like, or like, let's say like Smashing Magazine or something like mm -hmm. that, right? For something like that, it also makes sense to use WordPress headlessly, right? Mm -hmm. And then have a, especially a JavaScript framework to do like the generation. Because one advantage of all of these JavaScript frameworks is that you can run them on the edge. Oh. And on the edge now is not like the CDN really edge, but there is like, or it is similar to that, but um, for example, Cloudflare has the workers, and there is also like with Dino and like uh, like all of the other um, big hosts, they have like um, or AWS Lambda. This is usually where most of this uh, um, runs on. Mm -hmm. um, it's just although it is possible to run like um, PHP inside of a Lambda function on the edge or have it compiled now, that's the next thing, have it compiled to WASM and then run it in a um, in an edge function. Um, it is actually a lot easier and things are more optimized in these JavaScript frameworks to have them directly run on the edge. And then you just need to talk to um, uh, the uh, WordPress server API wants to get all the data maybe you have a caching layer in front of that for the uh, graphql uh, uh, queries and so on so that way you can could without having to statically generate all of the sites up front because for a site like uh, smashing magazine that's probably um, almost uh, impossible like with not impossible with the right caching and so on. You, you can still do it, mm. but you could also say, okay, we, we do an on, uh, on demand rendering of the pages and then cache them. And, but we do that on the edge and this can be done with a JavaScript mm -hmm. uh, framework like uh, next or um, Astro, for example. And in, in these kind of situations, this is like super, uh, a super big advantage, right? Um, because all of like, you don't need the computing power 
anywhere on one single server only for the API that serves the data, but the actual rendering and like a lot of the other stuff is done as close to the visitor as possible. Okay, great. So can be huge performance benefit for very large, uh, high traffic, internationally visited websites. Great. Uh, yeah, I was thinking, yeah, okay, so the rendering then probably can be controlled better, can be faster on the edge. Uh, but still, yeah, that central API still needs to be handled as well, right? You probably want to cache that data as well. So um, it's not like in real time access from the server. Otherwise, that would be the API server. WordPress uh, server would be the bottleneck again. Mm -hmm. But I think that's also something that took me a while to understand as well, the different approaches, right? Statically generated sites based on a headless approach, like where you create that site uh, on um, when you're building actually the, the project, right? And then it's like just like starting a generated site based on WordPress backend. But then like you can't really, yeah, the, the WordPress backend doesn't help you with cha updating the site. You will always need a developer or some kind of hook, right? To trigger that build process and so on. Whereas dynamically headless uh, sites are more like close to the interactive side of WordPress, but then you got to still deal with uh, the caching topics uh, and so on and performance and having probably something like a node infrastructure and a PHP infrastructure and so on. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and now we uh, make a little uh, or like some ads uh, for this again, not paid. <laughs> but uh, again, WP Engine, uh, they have um, they have an integrated hosting platform for Headless. It's called uh, Atlas. So you get like a node environment and a PHP environment. And they also have an open source framework called Faust.js, which um, is based on Next.js, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But they also offer um, a, a quite a bit of um, extra functionality like um, the template hierarchy, for example. They have that uh, um, like written in uh, JavaScript and so on. So it feels a lot closer to um, WordPress uh, development. So if you come from this uh, from WordPress and you want to check it out, Faust is probably the easiest way to get going mm -hmm. um, because uh, like Next offers also a lot of this like caching stuff. And again, they have so many three letter acronyms, right? Like SSG, RSG, ISG, uh, DSG. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. what, whatever you want. Uh, but uh, no, they have um, different caching strategies, like um, where you can say a site should automatically be um, cached 60 minutes, let's say. But uh, whenever it's stale, um, you serve it first, right? And then uh, you mm -hmm. uh, regenerate the site in the background and so on. So th there are like a lot of um, nice um, little, little things uh, that you can do there. All right, cool. Yeah, I just I just went onto the Faust.js website. Well, the first thing I noticed uh, is they have a folder com called components uh, with, with the components to render this. Reminds me uh, of Flint again, because you also have a components folder, then they have a pages, yeah. WP templates, but everything like in JavaScript, right? So yeah, um, looks cool and interesting, but probably you need to dig very much into it. And yeah. if that's your thing. Yeah, again, if you're used to, cool. if you're used to WordPress, um, and having a, a web server running in the background, it will be a, a really big mind shift um, to go to headless mm -hmm. WordPress. Because also like forms mm -hmm. don't work, right? If you don't have like w with the static uh, uh, part of it, like um, mm -hmm. you can't have forms, you need to post it to some web service, like any search is really uh, uh, important. You can, of course, create like JSON uh, uh, files with an index. Mm -hmm. But when you have a lot of pages, a lot of content, you need to think about either like an external service or run something like uh, Elasticsearch or uh, uh, something like that yourself. Um, and this um, gets like really complicated. So having a server in, in the background is always uh, quite nice. And that's also why um, these uh, non-statically generated headless WordPress things are not that far away from WordPress, but still you have to implement a lot of things differently than you would like in WordPress land, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's what I feel like. You, you probably got to think about every single WordPress plugin and things like that, that what you want to, want to use, how that works and how you want to use that, how that integrates, because uh, I can see how you could quickly hit a wall with um, most plugins. At the same time, we also don't rely a lot on plugins that mm -hmm. do front end work, but most of the plugins we use are back end related, like giving a nicer editing experience, structure, uh, disabling stuff, uh, adding SEO, meta data, and so on. So I can see how we're like technically not that far away and can probably make it happen um, or similar to our approach with Flint. But but still, I feel it's it's a longer way. Mm. I'm probably, I'm biased. I'm probably just scared. I should try it out. I should like <laughs> make my experiences with that. I can see the use cases specifically with the high traffic uh, websites, having a nice development experience with large teams and so on, enterprise scale, very specific things. Yeah, it's um, and it's probably if I would be a lot younger starting with coding and dig a lot into JavaScript frameworks, then I'd be probably also be a lot more open. So I'm probably just, I, I became too much of a practical person um, to re to get overly excited about this yet. Mm. But thanks for, for explaining. I, I feel like I understood it much, much better yeah. now. You're welcome. So one of the reasons also why Flint is, or in order to use Flint with a headless approach, we w would have to change a little bit because what we have currently is we have co-located everything that belongs to a single component in one folder, right? And actually, we really like that. So we like that the defin data definition is right next to like the JavaScript and the um, and the uh, template and whatsoever. And um, in a headless uh, environment, you sort of strip the data definition out, right? So it would be like in general, we have one developer taking care of a single component. If we do the headless way like there would probably be someone in WordPress uh, or just taking care of the WordPress API, a backend developer, defining all the components again. And uh, like this is not from a workflow um, in at least small um, scales like we usually um, work in. And that's not like really small scale, but small to mid, uh, mid scale. Um, it is more efficient to have everything uh, done by the same mm. person, right? Well, but that might actually be also a point for headless because I know that there are a lot of agencies who are splitting this very mm. much. Like they have backend developers, they do all backend stuff, and then front developers, they only do templating yep. HTML, CSS. We don't do that. We have a very integrated approach with data definitions. So, and we very much like that, as you explained. But for agencies or companies who like to split that very much and say backend developers only backend front only front then at least like the borders are very mm. clear way do the handover and say that's all my field everything that i do within my my headless framework that's uh, my front end framework rendering that's my thing everything else is not you got to yeah. create that api and functionality for me as a backend developer yeah. although <laughs> as a front-end developer again you have to implement stuff like form handling in the front end right where do you send the data to to an api again and then you're probably not just doing styling but you still gotta work with apis and that are more kind of like i feel like backend development skills the skill set of a backend developer so then you might have people who are doing the back end again support people who are in the in the front end with connecting apis again right mm. yeah people help me with that how are you working with headless what are your experiences write a comment below let us know and cheerio <laughs>